Hi, I'm James Hayes, and it's my pleasure to be presenting to you. Today, I'm going to be talking about using thermal imaging to understand human grasping of objects. Uh, I'm a professor at Georgia Tech. I'm also a scientist at Argo AI. And before I start talking about the main uh, work today, thermal grasping, I do want to advertise some of the work that's come out of Argo, in particular a data set we released last summer at CBPR called Argoverse. This is a self-driving vehicle data set that contains vehicle tracking data, like in the top left, where we have cuboids over uh, any dynamic objects in a scene, and we also have camera and LIDAR. Uh, in the bottom left there, we have a uh, motion and forecasting data set visualized. This is hundreds of thousands of bird's eye view scenarios of how objects and scenes have moved, and the task is to predict the future, given a couple seconds of observation. Can you say where a particular vehicle is going to go? And both of these tasks are made easier if you use HD maps, which is what's visualized on the right. Argoverse was the first data set to release HD maps. And what we mean by HD maps are maps with lane level geometry and not just uh, like something you could get off Google Maps. In addition, these maps contain ground height at one meter resolution and uh, an indication of where the drivable area is. Um, and since we released our data set, there have been other great self-driving vehicle data sets released, a couple that have HD maps as well. Um, but if you want to use Argoverse, you can go to argoverse.org and download it. We have a, a pretty nice API, I think, that you can uh, get on GitHub, and we're pretty responsive to questions with using the data. And we're running a competition right now uh, that will end on June 10th, uh, just in time for CVPR this summer. And uh, right now I'm highlighting the leaderboard for the motion forecasting competition, where the task, again, is to predict the future for agents in a scene. And we've got a lot of entries in this competition, and it's really fun to see what people are coming up with. And uh, because the deadline for this competition is just a week away, we're seeing a lot of activity on the leaderboard. All right. Uh, but the rest of today, I'm going to be talking about a series of works led by my student, Samarth Brombat, who's now a postdoc at Intel with Vladlin Colton. And uh, our idea is to use thermal imaging to help understand how people interact with objects. So to motivate this, well, first of all, I'm a computer vision researcher, and this is not your usual computer vision work. Most computer vision research focuses on uh, understanding images. Um, so this is the image of the Sistine Chapel painted by Michelangelo. And on the right here, there's a theory that what's depicted behind God there is a brain. And about a third of our brain is dedicated to visual processing. Uh, so it's not surprising that computer vision is hard. Um, but we're not going to be talking about <clears throat> as much that part of the brain today as, uh, as this, the hands. Hands are really amazing, and this is a research area that's new to me. Um, but it, it really is um, <clears throat> amazing what humans can do with our hands. And uh, it seems important for robots to be able to do some of those things as well if they're going to coexist with us in the world. Contact is important for a lot of things, for human-to-human -human, uh, interaction, for human-to-object interaction. Again, if we want robots to do it as well, maybe they should learn from the way that we interact with objects. I guess some of the human-to-human -human interaction is not recommended in the current uh, climate. Um, so handshaking is probably out. Uh, but actually, still understanding how people interact with objects is maybe even more important to understand things like how germs might spread in an environment. So there's been a ton of research, uh, really interesting research on trying to understand how humans grasp or trying to make robots better at grasping. Here's an example of, a, of an arm farm at Google where robots are training themselves to make stable grasps. It's very cool work. There are limitations, of course, that the grasping they're doing is not very human-like. They're just using finger-like pincers. That, and uh, the environment's not very realistic either, right? They're just in, in gray boxes there. So they're more focused on finding a stable grasp than a realistic grasp or knowing how to use an object or something like that. Um, there's some cool work that addresses one of these limitations about the environment from Avinav Gupta's group at CMU, where, again, it's a similar type of grasping, but the environment is different. In fact, they took lots of these mobile robots to various Airbnb locations in Pittsburgh and just had the robots play in those environments and then move them to another Airbnb so, that, so you get object grasping in a realistic environment, which I thought was very clever. Again, there's a lot of work on understanding human grasp as well. Here's just one from Deva Ramanan's group. And what you can see visualized here, I think is cool, is that this is one pose of the hand. So the hand is in roughly the same pose for all three of these, but the forces being exerted and the contact 
are very different. As you can see, the green is in the contact and the, the red arrows show the forces. But these contacts and forces are not directly measured, they're, they're estimated through some optimization. And, and maybe that's accurate, but there's not exactly ground truth for that. And so what we're trying to do is get ground truth for this contact in particular, to really know for sure where was the hand touching an object. And again, there's more related work um, that could be highlighted. I'll, I'll highlight the, these bottom two. Uh, this one appeared in Nature, a tactile glove. It's another way to try and figure out where contact is happening between an object and a hand. And this one is called tactile mesh saliency was in SIGGRAPH is a crowdsourced approach to estimating where people touch objects. Okay, but why is it difficult um, to figure out where contact is happening? And the, the fundamental reason I think is that uh, because of occlusion, because contact necessarily means that two things are interacting, a hand and an object. And if you're trying to image this with a camera, let's say, then the hand is of course blocking where the, where the contact is happening. So it's hard to tell just looking at this image, like is, is the, is the ring finger there touching the camera at the first knuckle or not? Like, it's hard to tell, right, even for a human. So our big insight in this is that you can do after the fact inspection of contact using thermal imagery. So what we had here was somebody press their hand against a piece of plastic in the lab, remove their hand, and then we image that plastic two seconds later on the left and five seconds later and 10 seconds later. And if you compare, over time, you can see that the contact is blurring out a bit. You're losing some detail here that, that was visible here because the, the heat is diffusing through the plastic, but it's not super fast. And within 10 seconds, that's enough time to scan an object. Um, and it's pretty sharp. You know, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good spatial resolution about, about what the contact was. So we're going to take advantage of this, and we're going to 3D print a bunch of objects. We 3D print them instead of using real objects because certain real materials don't lead themselves to this type of thermal inspection. Glasses and glossy plastics, anything fluid filled, none of those retain thermal images very well. But this uh, PLA, this material for, for 3D printing works fantastically well. So we just printed a bunch of, of virtual objects. We have 3D models of these that are in perfect correspondence with the printed object, which will be useful later. And you can see that there's some abstract objects there and then some real world objects. They're at roughly real world scale as well. And we're going to ask people to interact with these, uh, either to use them or to pick them up as if they were going to hand them off. And then we're going to set them on a turntable and scan them with this setup, at least for this first project, where we have a thermal camera. It's a FLIR Boson 640, so it's 640 by 480 resolution, which is pretty good. A camera like that used to be very expensive, but now it's you know, a couple thousand dollars, very affordable. And that's mounted to a connect so that we can get RGB and depth information at the same time when we put these objects on a turntable. And here's what it looks like after somebody has been told to, to use this plastic bottle, we put it on a turntable and scan it like this. It's gonna take nine steps and it's being scanned each time. And I love this video because it's super boring. There's nothing going on here. This just looks like a plain uh, you know, 3D printed bottle. Why would you bother to scan this? It's because again, of the hidden information. So here's the same scan from the thermal camera. And you can see that they, okay, they had their whole hand wrapped around it. You can see what, where the fingers are, where the thumb is. And there's also some contact at the top, like they were going to unscrew this pretend cap. Uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to visualize these like this and this color maps with a little more contrast so you can see the contact more clearly. We also capture depth at the same time, just so that we can uh, help project this thermal texture onto the object a little better. Here's a visualization of that that pipeline, we take these nine views, we recover the pose of the object at each time step, and then we project the thermal texture onto it. And we take these nine projected textures and make sure that they're agreeable through some optimization. And we get this contact map wrapped around the object, a camera in this case. Here's another, exa another example of one of these on, on a mug, and you can see that it's pretty seamless and, and captures most of the object. Of course, we missed some of it. For example, the bottom of the object, if they contacted it, we wouldn't be able to see it because this object was sitting on a turntable. All right, and in total, we had 50 objects. For 27 of the objects, we ask all 50 participants in our study to act like they're using the object. For some of the abstract objects, it doesn't make sense to ask them to use it. Or for things like the camera, it does. And for 48 of the objects, we asked them to grasp it if they, if they were going to hand it off to another human. And we get hundreds of thousands of total frames of, of grasping information. 
and 3,750 total textured objects with particular grasps. Here's an example of what these scans look like and how they differ between the functional instructions that we gave people. So on the left are the objects where we told people to grasp the object like you're going to use it. And on the right, we told them to grasp it like you're going to hand it to somebody else. And you can see differences. If they were going to use a banana, then they usually you know, grab the tip of the banana as if they were going to peel it, whereas if they were going to hand it off, they, they don't. And in fact, for most of the handoff uh, grasps, you see there's more empty area because people are intentionally leaving space for another human hand to grab on. For example, if you're going to use the binoculars, people are grabbing both barrels, they're using two hands. And if people are going to uh, hand off the binoculars, they only grasp one of the barrels. Uh, the scissors are also interesting, or knives. If you're going to use them, of course, you grab the handles so that you can use them. If you're going to hand them off, you actually grab the blade of the scissors or the knife so that the other person has area to grab it. Again, if, if you were using this data to train a robot, you might maybe want a robot to have the same sort of understanding about if they're going to hand an object off or if they're going to pick an object off that somebody else is holding. It would be good to understand human grasp, even if they don't have human-like grasping. So another uh, interesting bit of analysis we can do uh, from the data. So for each participant, we had them get a palm print like this in plastic. And we can measure how much their fingertip area is. That's the highlighted green area. And a lot of graspers, like those robotic graspers we showed early, or have this implicit assumption that grasps, you know, the fingers are important. You're trying to optimize for finger locations, maybe just two fingers, maybe more. But humans grasp with a lot more than fingers, right? And this is a quantitative evidence of that. So this red line is showing if somebody were using all of their fingertip area, this is the total area on a particular object, like a hammer that would be covered by contact. But in fact, what's measured on average is three or four times as much contact, which means that they must be using the rest of their fingers or their palm to envelop the objects as well. So maybe this is a motivation for robotic gripper design to include more human-like enveloping grasps with soft contact. We'll come back to this later with a more complex analysis. Um, we can also try to predict grasp for unseen objects or predict contact, I should say. So, if we have an object, uh, this is like a PlayStation controller, and here it's visualized as if it were a point cloud, uh, we can uh, get predictions about where contact might happen. In, case, in this case, we're getting diverse predictions because there's not just one way that somebody could grasp this. So we've trained multiple models to get a diversity of predictions. I, I would say the predictions don't exactly look human-like in this case, right? They, don't, they don't, you know, can't make out the fingers or the thumbs exam exactly. Um, and again, we'll try to address that a bit in, in later work. And here's just an example of where we've held out an object. For example, at test time, they're going to be asked to predict contact for this hammer. At training time, they did get a hammer, but it was different. And here's the type of results we can get. And qualitatively, it makes some sense that the red is showing contact in plausible areas, um, but it doesn't quite look realistic yet. So all of this data is available online. You can go to contactdb.cc.gotech.edu to get uh, these thousands of contact maps for these objects. So to summarize this first part of the work, I think these were the real clever ideas that um, the whole idea of using thermal imagery for retrospective contact analysis. Uh, we initially didn't try using 3D printed objects, but that ended up being a critical decision as well because they have good thermal properties and because they let us have a corresponding virtual model that's a perfect match. And the idea of telling people different ways to use the objects so that we get different types of grasps that emerge, that, that was important as well. And there's only two ways right now, either to, to use the object or to hand it off, but you could imagine others as well. There are some missing pieces for this first piece of work. This first piece of work was a best paper finalist at CVPR last year. Um, I'm going to show some follow-up work now. Um, one of the missing pieces was, you know, is this actually useful for humans? Or at least could we make a human learn from this in some, a robot learn from this in some capacity? So I'll briefly highlight a paper at IROS 2019 that does that. Another missing piece, I think the biggest one, is that we don't actually capture the hand pose. So I was showing you contact maps, and sometimes you could make out where, where the fingers and thumbs were. But if there were multiple hands involved, that becomes really hard. It'd be really good to know where exactly was the human hand with respect to the object when this contact occurred. That's trickier to capture, but we'll show how we did that. Another open question is whether pressure is captured. Some of these alternative 
methods for understanding contact are directly measuring pressure. And here we're not. It seems like we're getting more of a binary signal. There was or was not contact. Um, but And we have some initial work showing that it does seem like pressure is, is uh, encoded in these thermal images as well. But I'm not going to go into that today. And another, another limitation, which I'll just be honest about, is that uh, the data set is, is pretty big. It took a lot of work to build, but it would be great if it were bigger, but it's not clear how to capture this data faster. You know, you, there's a limitation that you need a human to actually grasp it, and then you need to actually scan it. Um, so it's not like easy to crowdsource or parallelize, it seems like. Um, it would be great to have hundreds and thousands of these grasps, not just thousands. All right, but let's look at some follow-up work. So uh, in this IROS work, this was a collaboration with Dieter Fox's group at NVIDIA. We uh, showed that you could put these contact maps into an optimization for a robot grasp so that the robot tries to touch the object at the same place that the human did, even if the human uh, and the robot grasper are pretty different. For example, if, uh, just go back, you know, if the robot grasper is only three-fingered. Um, and anyway, we show that it's, it's possible and that it does lead to human-like grasps of a robot in some cases. All right, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on this work, Contact Pose, which is under submission to ECCV 2020. And as you can see visualized here, now we're ca ca capturing not just contact maps, but also the hand pose. So uh, in red is the right fingers and, and green is the, the left fingers, left hand. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, for example, for these uh, you know, eyeglasses, you can see that people are only pinching with the fingers and the thumbs, the, the stems of the glasses. And if you just had that contact map, it might be hard to tell which, which fingers were actually in contact there. All right, uh, so this is a more involved capture setup in order to get this. Uh, so this uh, capture setup has an optical um, motion capture system. And we're going to be using motion capture not on the hands, but on the objects, so that we know the object pose in 3D as it's being grasped. We have three connects. Those are going to be used to recover the 3D hand pose during the, the grasping. And we still, again, have one thermal camera. And that objects are going to be set on this turntable right over here. And again, I said that the, uh, the motion tracking, the, the optical motion capture, is actually for the objects. So we're going to have motion capture markers on our 3D printed objects. And we tried a few different ways to put motion capture markers on these objects and have it not influence the grasps too much. We ended up settling on using these recessed markers so that the, they, they don't make a big surface deviation. So here's an, an example of our scissors with a few of these markers embedded into it. And here's what a capture setup a look, session looks like. So we're using um, this great work out of Yasher Sheik's group to do um, the real-time pose estimation or the landmark-based pose estimation. So it's finding human body landmarks. We're not really using those. It's also finding hand landmarks. So you can see the hand landmarks here. And because we have those hand landmarks in three different RGB views, we can triangulate and recover the 3D pose of, of the hand, uh, the joints with an optimization like this. Again, this open pose method, I would say, just works surprisingly well, even for unusual views of the hand. And the hand was grasping objects as well. So part of the hand was occluded a lot of times. And here's an example of after this optimization to recover the 3D hand joint locations. And we're using the, the motion capture to recover the object location. You can see the green markers on the object. Uh, what that looks like. And this uh, person holding the object is Samarth, the first author who deserves credit for all of this work. Um, we capture a similar amount of data, 50 objects, several thousand scans, um, different participants holding different objects with different instructions. And again, because we now know hand pose, we can do some cool new things. We can say for every bit of the contact map, which finger did that come from? So here are the different colors correspond to different fingers. So blue, for example, is the, where a pinky finger was grasping an object. Or we can do different joints on the finger. So here green is the last joint of the finger. And we can aggregate this over all objects and grasps to get visualizations like this showing how humans tend to use different joints during their grasp. 
actually have a better version of this I'll show you in a second. Uh, we can also find cases where the, the hand pose was similar, but the contact map that resulted was very different. For example, these two poses, these two grasps right here, one on the flashlight, one on the banana, a very similar hand pose, but the contact is, is, is hugely different. Here the contact is very limited. They're grasping this banana to hand it off to somebody and they're just got it with their thumb and their index finger. And here it's an enveloping grasp around a flashlight with a lot of contact area. We can also fit a parametric hand model to the hand pose, and that's visualized here. This is the Mano hand model. Um, and not only lead, this does this lead to nice visualizations, we'll show that this helps a little bit for our contact prediction experiments later. And we can use this model, again, to aggregate the same type of statistics I showed earlier. This is probably my favorite figure in this whole work that, that's emerged. This is a Mano hand model, and it's colored by the probability that that part of the hand was used to make contact with an object during some part of our experiment with these 50 different objects. It's very cool um, what, what emerges here. Uh, you can see fingertips are important, first of all. So, I mean, that, that's intuitive. We use our fingertips to grasp objects, but they're not uniformly important. Example, the pinky fingertip is not used a whole lot, in fact. In fact, the pinky fingertip is used uh, less than the, the palm, this part of the palm of the hand, which is a little bit surprising to us. Uh, again, if you're designing a robotic gripper, maybe this tells you something about how it should be designed. Um, and, yeah, and again, the entire pinky is, is really not used very much. So maybe that justifies things like three finger robotic grippers that do exist. Uh, we showed this uh, experiment earlier or this analysis earlier where we showed that a lot of contact is not the fingertips uh, we can do a better job now that we know exactly what the hand grasp was and we can associate contact more finely with either the fingertip or the fingers or the palm. Um, again, the same analysis holds for, for the average you know, PlayStation controller grasp. We can see that most of the contact is, is not from the fingertips. Maybe the most important functional grasp is where you're pressing buttons, but in fact, much of the hand is enveloping the controller as well. And we can also do analysis for, like this, where we look at a particular finger, let's say the index finger, and a particular object and say, well, for all of the grasps of the camera, where did people place their index finger? And we can see that oh, there's actually quite a bit of agreement. Uh, you're seeing an average grasp over 50 people. But you're seeing a lot of agreement that index finger would go here on this virtual button on the 3D printed camera, and the thumb would often go here on this four-way controller on the back. Again, people agree on where to put your thumbs on a PlayStation controller, mostly. A lot of times they're using the joy sticks. Sometimes they're using the buttons or where to put their index finger on a mouse. It's neat to see this agreement from people. Uh, and I think this analysis emerged from a question at a, at a talk. Um, somebody asked us if there was greater variation between the handoff poses, the handoff grasps, and the use poses. Because it seems like if you tell somebody to use a PlayStation controller, there's probably some agreement about how you place your hand to use it. But if they're just handing it to somebody else, maybe there's a lot more leeway about how you would grab it. And indeed, that turned out to be the case. There's a lot more variance in the handoff condition than the use condition. For things like a mouse or a frying pan, people really agree on how it should be used. They're grasping it in the same way. But if you're handing a frying pan to somebody, it's not clear how to do it. All right, and then let's uh, get to some actual learning experiments and not just analysis. So, for this work, we assume that if we're being asked to estimate contact on an object, not only do we know what the 3D model of that object is, but we know what, where the hand was. For example, if, you, know, you, can do the, you can recover this pretty well from a, from a depth camera to estimate hand pose. And maybe that hand pose can be represented again with a parametric model like Mano. And we're going to do some sort of feature extraction from the hand pose, although you could try encoding it naively, but it's often better to encode it on the surface of the object, encode something like, well, how far away was the hand from this point on the surface of the object? That would probably tell you how likely contact was, right? Combine that with a 3D model to get an estimate like this on the right. So that's an output from our machine learning model saying that for this particular object with this particular hand pose, this is where we think the contact was happening. And it, is pretty accurate. Knowing where the hand pose was is pretty strong prior, right? But it's still not trivial because you know, it's hard to know if, if, if a hand, you know, if the contact was actually happening or if the hand was just a couple of millimeters above the surface somewhere. So 
again, it, how do we encode the hand pose? You, you could just directly encode the 3D joint locations, but it tends to work better if you somehow encode in, in the object space how far away you were from a part of the hand, either a joint of the hand or the skeleton of the hand or the surface of the hand itself as, as represented by the, the Mano hand mesh. And it's a big table of numbers. Uh, just to highlight, um, what tends to work best is to use the mesh representation of the hand. And um, all of these are, are much better than chance, but the mesh representation works a little better than the, than the other alternatives. And we've tried different representations of the model, whether it's point net or, or voxel based representations. Um, and these are all way better than chance, um, but it's probably easiest just to qualitatively look at getting a result. So here's a prediction for a mug uh, that, that it did not see at training time. It didn't see this 3D model at training time, but we do give it a 3D model at test time. And, uh, and the prediction looks very reasonable. And you'll notice that one finger here is black. That means that those uh, joints were zeroed out or occluded. This is to simulate the fact that well, if you, this is an actual robot looking at an actual hand grabbing an object, maybe it doesn't see all of the fingers, or maybe there's noise on some of them. So we actually randomly drop out some of the fingers. And the model still learns to predict contact under those fingers, because you know, it knows that the person still has four fingers. And, uh, it's pretty close to the ground truth that you see here in the bottom right. OK, so just to, to recap, I've shown three different um, projects all using thermal grasp. So we started with Contact DP, which was the first work that just showed that it was possible to use thermal imaging to recognize where people had touched objects after the fact, but it didn't understand where their hands were actually posed. We showed that it, it is possible to use this to retarget uh, robotic grasps. And then most recently, we've used uh, a more complex capture setup to also capture hand pose at the same time that we're capturing the thermal uh, after image. All right, that's the end of my talk. I guess uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion that I'll have with you uh, 